This is Bible Academy. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Somo, and we continue our basic Bible series looking at the lesson on essentials, part two. Now, before we continue, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. <clears throat> Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and privilege and everything you provided so that we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds will be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. As you can see, I have the notes that I'm going to read from up on the board to help you follow along a little better. The only problem I have with this sometimes is my spelling, though uh, I read over it two or three times, I often find an error or two when I get down to the final reading. Let's begin with our introduction. Now this is important. I want you to listen to this introduction. Many of the things you're about to hear are more advanced. Some you may not agree with. It will, be, uh, it will challenge your current level of discernment. It is meant to. At the same time, it is to alert you to some things that are going on today that many believers accept or are unaware of because they do not have the level of discernment to see it, and they just accept it. Never closely examining whether it is true or not or right or not. Now let me just hold the tape here, you might say. I'm going to teach you some things that you may find very disagreeable with. All right? What I'm asking you to do is understand that this is exactly what Paul was talking about when he was referring to developing that discernment that we saw in Ephesians 4. It takes years to discern these things. And I'm going to save you some time by pointing out some things already. Hopefully you're ready for them. To let you know, because we're getting down towards, I think, some very difficult and trying times in the world. The quicker you grow, the better off you will be when those most difficult times come. Let me continue now. Some of the things I say and teach here may make you uncomfortable or downright disagree. You may disagree with them, but that is okay. There are many godly scholars who disagree on some doctrines. I'm just wanting you to know there's, there's room for disagreement. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Luganbill and I disagree on some things, but that's okay. If we agreed perfectly on everything, I think that would take away somewhat of our uh, personality and our skills and, and, and detract from, uh, not necessarily from the truth, but would be compromising who we are and just willing to get along. And we're, neither one of us are like that. That's why we stand out amongst others, but it may be because you do not fully understand it just yet. Now, that's what I'm trying to tell you. The reason you may disagree or you're uncomfortable is because you don't understand it yet. You may need more background, go a little deeper, or need to learn more. Or you may eventually say, well, I just can't understand that anymore, so I'm just not going to accept it. Some people do that. Now, what happens when you find something you disagree with? Last paragraph. This is where you set aside that what you do not understand, and then when you have more knowledge, you go back and look at that issue again, and you may find yourself understanding and agreeing with it. For many years, I accepted the pre-trib rapture. I was basically raised on that since I was a teenager. I started out on it. I kept on it through my first seminary experience. 
my second seminary experience, I began to question it. And then I had some serious doubts about it when I really went into these passages and studied, studied them in the Greek on my own. Even disagreeing with some really smart professors. This lesson is Essentials 2. We continue with the numbering from the previous lesson. The persecution of believers. The Bible consistently teaches that if you are a Christian who is serious about following Jesus Christ, obeying his word, living by faith, you will suffer. And offer, often that suffering comes in the form of persecution. Because of your faith, not because you're a jerk, not because you disobey the law, not because you're trying to impose yourself and your views on people where you probably shouldn't. I like to use illustration. Don't, don't necessarily go up and witness to an airplane pilot when he's landing the plane. He's just a little busy. All right? So use your common sense. That's what I'm saying. But people will persecute you because of your faith. Now, what I want to expand on here is what is your faith? Because I think people often see that as quite limited. You shouldn't. Let's look at this a little closer. Your faith includes not only what you believe, but how you live it. This involves your viewpoint, your values, your priorities, your way of dealing with people and different situations. Your faith is reflected in what you say, your vocabulary, your tone, your attitude toward a lot of things and different kind of people, how you view different type of people. Even in your clothing, your style, what you wear reflects something of who you are. It includes your responses and reactions to all kinds of things. Something a politician says, something uh, you, you, you read about, some news item. It's how you live out what you believe. That's who you are. Don't detach that when you think about being persecuted for your faith because people will persecute you because of who you are, even if you don't mention Christ. Because your attitudes are different, your opinions are different, your vocabulary, and so on, you see? But that's to be expected. Sometimes you have just to be somewhere. And if you're not conforming to what's going on, you start to get persecuted. You say, well, they don't even know I'm a Christian. Yes, but you are a Christian. And even though they may not know you're a Christian, it doesn't take long for them to realize you're not one of them. And you find this at work, at school, out in social circles, at clubs, shopping, just about anywhere you go. Someone expresses opinion, you don't agree, you may get some stares. Now, you've probably all experienced this. If you're in the hospital, you have a different view about death than others. You see? C. The suffering is not just when you publicly speak of your faith, but for who you are becoming in Christ. It is who you are as reflected in your honesty, living apart from corru corruption when you can, how you discipline yourself, treat your fans, your friends, your spouse, your children. Your faith shows in how you spend your time, your energy, your money. It reflects in what you have materially. What are your goals and motives in life? Uh, we often get looked down upon. I, I, I don't say that a lot. I mean, not, not a whole lot, but occasionally when someone hears that we've homeschooled our children, they wonder, what do you mean by rejecting the school system? Usually it's somebody who's in the school system or who's deeply involved in it. Their kids are or their teachers or administrators or something. They don't understand why you can't put your children in public schools. They're not going to have the social 
interaction that they must have to be normal. They're not going to get the right education. That is nonsense. We've proven that six times. It's just nonsense. We're more interested in teaching our children real history, the importance of reading and writing and math and basic skills. We don't care about all the philosophy and all the junk that's being passed on out there as education. Whether it be uh, what's going on with the environment or how we should view uh, all these people who have problems with their gender, you see? Nothing really offended me more than to see a man who is a homosexual walk into a girl's restroom. I was working in a store. He'd come in regularly. The manager would have to do something about it, but they didn't. I mean, you think they would, but they don't. They're afraid. Well, see, now, if somebody walked in on my daughters and it was a male, he'd be out of there real quick. You might be surprised how much energy I get real quick when I see something like that that's going to affect my family members. You see, that's my attitude as a Christian. I'm not passive about that. I'm protective of my children, not because that's what a responsible parent is, but because of my values. Now, that may not set right with some of you. Here's what I got to say. Let's learn Scripture. All right. Let's look at D. Persecution of the Christian is persecution for being a Christian. It may come in many forms and from many places. Family, friends, acquaintances, people you barely know, or your neighbor. It may be organized opposition from government, political groups, social movements, your company for which you work, your social circle, and many others, including Christians. Um, let me give you another instance. My son, uh, a year or so ago, walked on his college campus, and they were having a protest, one which we didn't agree with at all, at all. He didn't. Participate, of course. He hardly even acknowledged them. You know, just get out of my way, let me go to class. This is the type of thing you're going to have to do the rest of your life as a Christian. Now, I don't know the detail in other countries, but our country is getting so fouled up in political correctness, in uh, people who are allowed to violate the rules and regulations of the United States, that it is causing all sorts of rift within our country. And as a Christian, you have to carefully separate between sometimes what is political and what is truth. Now these are things that are going to take some growth because, as we will see later when we talk about the evangelical community, evangelical community sometimes promote things that maybe they shouldn't. Some churches make it their causes. But we grow into those things. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I will give you what the Bible says about it and share the divine viewpoint from my understanding of it. D. Oh, by the way, notice the end of D, including Christians. All types of, types of groups will oppose you, including Christians those who call themselves Christians. And you know, Christians are on the opposite side of many issues. Opposite side of many issues. But this is not news to us. E, Jesus warned of this to the unbeliever before they committed themselves to follow him. Now, I read that right. Jesus warned of this to the unbeliever before they committed themselves to follow him. We studied this in Counting the Cost. He warned people, if you're going to follow me, it's going to cost you. It may cost you your family, your job, your position. 
your reputation, so on. But you decide who you're going to follow. Well, folks, I follow Christ. I don't care what people say or what people do about it. That is who I follow. He is my Lord, my Savior. My full allegiance is to Him. He comes before everything, even family, country, you see. Look at some of these verses if you want to look them up. I, I'm not going to take the time to look them all up. It would probably triple the time of our lessons, but you can look them up. You can pause right now and look them up. Matthew 10, 37 through 38, 16, 34, Mark 8, 34, Luke 9, 23, 14, 26 through 34. Let's look at Luke 14, 27. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Carrying the cross is figurative for the willingness to suffer as Christ did. If you're not willing to suffer, don't become a Christian. Did you hear that? Oh yeah, but we need to be saved. Well, now we go back to the parable of the soils, don't we? What's going to happen when you get persecuted? Understand what you're getting into, and then get into it, you see? That's the way you ought to do it. Now, related to persecution is suffering, but not all suffering is related to persecution. Now, I, what I'm trying to do is help you understand that there's a difference between persecution and suffering, but some, certainly, persecution is suffering. F, persecution brings in heavenly reward. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Notice there's blessing in being persecuted, being insulted. Did you know that? I mean, that puts a whole different light on it. And falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Now, when I say because of me... Of course, that's because of Christ, but that goes back to who you are in your faith. Because you're a Christian. Because you live out your faith. It's not because you just mentioned the name Jesus Christ. It's because of who you are in Christ and how you live your life. Listen to what we're to do from Jesus. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You're in a good crowd if you're persecuted for your faith. Luke 6, 22, blessed are those, excuse me, blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize and insult you and reject your name as evil on account of the Son of Man, on account of Christ. You can be happy knowing that you're standing out in the world. Now, this is where I should have said related to persecution is suffering, but not all suffering is, replated, is uh, related to persecution. I sometimes try to have a transitional statement. That was it. Just in the wrong place, but now it is. It's fine. Now let's talk about suffering. Again, related to persecution is suffering, but not all suffering is related to persecution. In other words, you can suffer for not being a believer. Now what I mean by that is you can, be, you can suffer as a believer, but it's not specifically because you're taking a stand for Christ. You can just suffer because God wants you as his child to grow, to mature. Let's look at some of these principles. Some suffering is to test your faith for spiritual growth. James 1, 2. And its quality, that is the quality of your faith. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7. B. Some suffering is for discipline and training. It teaches you how to be dependent upon the Lord. It teaches that God will pull you out of this situation eventually. Proverbs 3.11 Do not reject, my son, the discipline of the Lord, and do not loathe his correction. 3.12 Because whom the Lord loves, he reproves. Don't miss that love part even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. 
I don't know how many of you have children out there, but as parents, we love our children. And one of the great areas of patience that we learn as parents is to be patient with our children and their learning, to see them make decisions that hurt them, especially big ones, to see them reject our sound advice. It's difficult. And sometimes they bring misery on themselves that would have been unnecessary had they listened to their parents. Well, the Lord in the same way loves us. And he lets us go our own way sometime, bring our own discipline upon ourselves. But sometimes when we get completely out of line, he will enter in and discipline us. We call that divine discipline for sin, for getting out of God's will. We've learned that we need to confess our sins when that happens. The Lord sometimes takes us out behind the woodshed with that switch to train us to make wise decisions so we can be useful to Him. C. Suffering is a gift of grace. I kind of like this one because most people don't think of it that way. Philippians 129. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Suffering for a believer is natural. If you didn't suffer, you wouldn't grow. It's something we should be learning. 2 Timothy 2.3 Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. We stay in there doing what we need to do. And if it includes suffering, we do it. That's the duty of a soldier. He accomplishes his mission. He fulfills his duty. If you are pursuing truth, as we have learned it so far, you too will suffer for a number of reasons and causes. Now folks, that's guaranteed. Sometimes the suffering persecution will come from religion. The greatest suffering from people. You can look at your list in the New Testament, John the Baptist, all the apostles, the Lord himself, came from religious people. And not so much the pagan idolatrous religion, but by those who think they know the truth and they do not. Many will call themselves Christians and claim to be within the evangelical community. So much of your suffering is going to come from fellow Christians. When they find out that you're serious about Bible study, you may find out that they don't care for that and they no longer care for you. And that's a sad commentary, but that's also an accurate commentary on the condition of the church today. Point 10, the evangelical community and its decline. Now this is, of course, part of the problem is the design of the evangelical community. Let's, let's talk about it first. A is sort of a definition. Evangelicalism is the belief that Christians should be evangelizing the world for Christ through proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now let's understand, this is one of the main reasons we're still here on earth. We're here to evangelize. We're here to lead people to Christ. We're lead to here to support those who do. And we're to take every opportunity to tell those who are searching for God, searching for Christ, searching for answers, the opportunity, take that opportunity and tell them about Christ. Now, I want to make this clear. Look at my writing here in italics. The above point is a major part of our mission at Bible Academy and my personal belief as well. 
All believers should take every opportunity to tell people of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, and that through faith in his person and work, they can have eternal life. Now, the good thing about this lengthy explanation in this little italics portion is that so much of the gospel, and we'll cover this in a moment, that's part of the decline, is not given properly, or it's a different gospel, to put it simply. Well, let's go ahead and look at B. The decline of evangelicalism has continued for decades. This has happened in many ways. I shall name some major ones. Perhaps the largest, yet not so obvious, is number one. The gospel is presented in an incomplete, distorted, or wrong manner, therefore not the gospel. Now what I'm saying here is, you can't leave out essential parts of the gospel. It won't be the gospel. And we've talked about this, people have to understand who Christ is, that they're sinners, that they need a Savior, and the only way to heaven is through Christ. And you may have even heard well-known preachers saying, well, there may be other ways into heaven that God has provided for certain people. Some really believe that, that through certain other religions they have their path to God. No, they don't. That would be contrary to God's word, and God doesn't lie. And of course, his word doesn't either. Some of the ways they did it back in the days of Paul, A, they try to be clever, or making it sound like something it is not. 1 Corinthians 1.17 B, they add legalism and distort it. Galatians 1.7 C, they redesign it according to what people want to to hear. D. They are not straightforward with it. Galatians 2.14 Listen, if people are wanting the word, just give it to them. Don't soften it. Don't uh, beat around the bush. Tell them the truth. That's what their heart needs and if they're searching, that's what they truly desire. Don't withhold that in any way. Another way, they have a different gospel. 2 Corinthians 11.4. That's very common today. It's a different gospel. They talk about the good news, but it's not the good news that the Bible defines as the good news. F. They may use their own, and listen to this one, non-biblical definition of faith, grace, God, or Jesus Christ. I've heard all of those. People redefine who God is. You know, obvious ones would be like, well, God's just nature, or God, God is just within everybody, that kind of stuff. Sounds wonderful, but it's a lie. You see? Or they talk about Jesus Christ as a good man. They just want to follow his teachings, and if you're good enough, then you can get to heaven. No, that's not the gospel. G, those preaching a different gospel are to be accursed. <laughs> Don't miss that one, Galatians 1.8. And there's a lot of people out there that are under a curse from God because they lie and don't tell the truth about his son. This is a major one, folks. It goes on to people who simply uh, just talk about Jesus and say, invite him into your life, invite him into your heart. These are not biblical terms used for the gospel. We've studied this extensively, especially over in John, the gospel of John, when, when you get around to studying the gospel. Two, another point of decline, the priorities of teaching and preaching the truth of God's word has been substituted with emotional, motivational and positive thinking sermons. 
Now, what goes on in churches has a lot to do with the decline of evangelicalism. Of course, it extends into the Bible colleges and universities and the seminaries and those schools as well, all the way to the churches and then the people. So, when they leave out teaching the word, people pick up on what the world has to say. And that's what goes on. That's what goes on with the gospel. What sounds good to people that they'll accept? Three, we talk about the worship services here. The services, rather than sound Bible teaching, have little or no teaching and are filled with numerous other activities under the guise of worship. I mean, I have seen some of the silliest things. I do not understand why pastors have decided to go for this movement that is basically designed to get people into their church. Just get them there, and then eventually we'll talk to them about the gospel. When you go to a church service, do you go to be entertained? Well, there are churches who are there are churches that are designed like that now to entertain you. So the services are fun. Uh, it's not that you're not supposed to have fun, but we're to worship, we're to learn the word, we're to pray, we're to praise God. But what they've redefined worship as is a major contribution towards the decline of the true gospel getting out and people growing in the word. Four makes the point these above points have been shaping the churches to the point that there is little distinction between the churches. I suppose this is one of the biggest shocks that if someone is to come back that lived 50 years ago in a when there were good churches around, that they would come in and see the change that's going on. They say, what is all this stuff? What's the bandstand up there for? Uh, why aren't people taking this serious? Why aren't they preaching the word? One of my biggest disappointments was to go to a, a well-known Bible teaching church. Uh, my wife and I were searching for a church to attend for a while and uh, we went to one it was it was pretty good preaching pretty good teaching and the preacher left and within a short time his replacement who I knew by the way who was not trained to do what he did unless he picked it up somewhere else that I didn't know but anyway they changed the complete format of the church it's no longer preached the word was bring the people in. What do you do to bring people in? Make it fun. Make it entertaining. Don't call for any time commitment. So you say, well, then they had their Bible teaching in the Sunday schools. The problem with that is you go to the Sunday schools, and it's sometimes it's psychological. It's uh, selective in that different with people go to their different issue classes. And the Bible teaching is still lax. But that's been the trend for a number of years now, and it continues to be the trend. I think that's all part of getting us ready for the great movement of apostasy across the world. Five, it is not that a church cannot have some of these activities. It's not that you can't have uh, enjoyment and fellowship with those in your church. Let me continue the point. But without consistent sound Bible teaching, there's no spiritual growth. If you don't have a time of Bible teaching, then what are you doing? What are you doing there? You see? I'm not saying you can't have a choir. I'm not saying the children can't have their activities. I'm not saying that at all. But if there's no Bible teaching, people don't grow, period. And this has been a major contributor to the decline. Next paragraph, what has happened to the evangelical community is what happened to those under the Mosaic law in the period of the law and much of the early church 
in our day. So what I'm saying is, the watering down of the word, the lack of accurate evangelism or no evangelism, went on in the early church, especially when it came to some of the troubling teaching that Paul was having to face, even from his fellow uh, apostles. They lost track of why they were there. They got caught up in the movement. Um, Peter in Galatians. Caught up back into the legalism where people were comfortable instead of challenging that and teaching the truth. You go along with the crowd. You don't grow that way. So again, let me begin this Paragraph, what has happened to the evangelical community is what happened to those under the Mosaic Law. And we're talking about even under Israel. And that is why they got disciplined as a nation. In the period of the law and much of the early church in our day, it's happening in our day too. And that is that the teaching has gotten muddled with legalism and tainted by much of the world system. The sermons are filled with more emotion than substance and more ways for people to feel good about themselves than hearing the truth. Now, a lot of this sounds pretty negative. But as you grow in the Word, you're going to agree with these things. Any Christian with a lick of discernment can see right through this stuff and know how they are not getting fed. You know you're not getting fed. You leave empty, disappointed. some point you'll get fed up and not go back, look somewhere else, or begin to look right away. Continue, but since so many Christians do not properly discern, that reveals just how poor a shape evangelicalism is in. Evangelicalism is in. And the more we learn our Bible, the more this will become clear of what is truth and what is an error. At the same time that evangelicalism has declined, it has grown in its culture in accordance to this decline. Let's talk about the culture, point 11. The evangelical culture is the value system that is carried over into the lifestyle of those within the community. B, emotionalism, materialism, positive thinking mentality, legalism, and distortion of the gospel carries over into the various aspects of their society so they so that they have their own types of entertainment including movies TV music and sports activities C they have their own spiritual vocabulary and language jewelry art just like you'll find in many cultures I'm just saying the culture is what a culture is. It reflects who the pe these people are and what they do, their likes and dislikes. D, this flows back into the cult churches so that what drives the Christian businesses are driving some of the evangelical churches. Example. Popular feel-good preaching. That goes on in churches. That goes on in bookstores, Christian bookstores. A feel-good mentality that comes out of Christian churches goes right into those books and people buy those books. Now, next paragraph, do not misunderstand. I'm not saying that the evangelical community culture is at all bad. Rather, is all bad? Not at all. I would rather watch a moral movie or read a good, clean book than one that is not. But today, a Christian has to be very discerning in the evangelical community. And that's a warning I would give to those who want to go to a Bible college or, or a seminary or even a Christian university. You're liable to see a lot of legalism. A lot of the very things we've just talked about in the last few points and sub-points. 
and it's very easy to get caught up into that because just about everybody else is. I've seen that myself, experienced some of it myself. And only when you get away from it or get out of it or spend some time away from it do you realize how wrong that is, how they don't have their priorities. Same is true of a church. Till you start hearing Bible teaching, you sometimes don't realize it, what you've been missing. Continue, for within it lies many traps, legalism, self-righteousness, emotionalism, materialism, and many others. <clears throat> there are evangelical preachers who have their own sales system or sell things or peddle material things. Just like any other popular personality. That's what I mean by the materialism. And this is what makes it such a trap. Many think because it is approved or accepted by the community or some popular preacher, then it must be good and safe. Of course. This includes their music, their books, whatever they endorse. There's your business. So this means you must be discerning even within the Christian community. And, and make no mistake about it, we are part of the Christian community. We're part of the evangelical, conservative Christian community. But that doesn't mean you still, that you drop your discernment. The devil has planted many traps within the community. So always be discerning if you are not you are setting yourself up for a big disappointment. I've heard stories of people being turned off to Christianity because what they actually did was get caught up in the community or the culture and found it pretty empty. And they leave everything. You know, it's like throwing the baby out with the bathtub or the bath water. <laughs> e. Evangelical schools, colleges, universities, and seminaries support and promote many of the same things so there is little difference among them. And what I'm saying is, uh, I remember years ago uh, uh, experiencing this as myself as a young man. You had your Pentecostals. And the Charismatic came on a rise in the 60s. I became very aware of it in the 70s. And it didn't take long, but just a few decades before people started saying how wonderful the charismatic worship services were. So a lot of the mainland, mainland or mainline, I should say, mainline denominations started adopting them, thinking that's what they had to do to keep their crowds or they started splitting their services to different types of worship services. They still do that, the traditional and the contemporary. <laughs> and what I'm trying to get all of you to understand, that's not even the point. Where's the Bible teaching? You see? Where's the Bible teaching? I could go through many experiences. There's, there's just one I'll mention. My wife and I attended a church, and um, it had the charismatic worship service pattern, even though it was a well-known Baptist church. That moved towards that, and you would stand for almost 30 minutes, clapping and singing. Well, we didn't stay there much. We moved on before you knew it. But what happens is this is what Christians begin to think they're supposed to be doing. No. No. If they're not teaching the word, if they're not preaching the word, I don't care if you use the word preach or not, proclaiming it, then why are you there? What I'm trying to say with point E is that this is so prominent now amongst the schools and colleges and universities and graduate seminaries that it's passed on to all the churches around them so that the Presbyterian aren't that much different than the Baptist, the Baptists aren't that much different from the Methodists, the Methodists 
and all of them aren't much different than the charismatic churches now. F, the same, this sameness convinces many Christians into thinking that this is what Christianity is all about. G, morality is often enforced where it overextends into legalism so that many add rules and call things sin that the Bible does not call sinful. Now that's one end of it. H, morality is certainly good and right. In fact, a spirit-filled Christian will live over and above that. By that I mean he'll not only be moral, but more than moral. For example, loving your neighbor as yourself. Most people would not see that as a requirement for morality. But that's a standard Jesus gave us. I, though biblical morality is certainly commendable, without in-depth Bible teaching, that person is no different, now listen to this, no different than any individual or group of moral unbelievers. Morality is for the human race. Believer and unbeliever are not supposed to murder, commit adultery, or lie, or steal. That's, that's for the human race. That's how we survive. That's how we function as a society. Marriage, male and female. Comment. I know that this is what many of you have fled from religious denominations and churches because you realized you were not being taught the scripture or not taught enough or in depth enough. But many, however, that didn't flee remain in those churches because they think they're in the right place and doing the right things. Point 12, an interesting point for you. Why you are different. Now you know probably all of this, but let me just remind you. A, what makes you different is the very thing that God wants from every person on this planet. He wants them seeking Him and living according to His will. The way the Bible describes this is seeking the kingdom of God. Matthew 6:33. B, you entered that quest for the kingdom when your heart turned toward God and then when presented the gospel or good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you followed through by believing in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. C, what did you do after this? Though you did not know much about it in your pursuit of God and Christ, you were pursuing truth. Many at this point, after being saved, do not know what to do next. So they often turn to the nearest person or group who they believe is Christian and ask. They often get led into one of the many movements we have discussed that neutralizes the believer. Few, in fact, continue to seek the kingdom with all their heart in an all-out pursuit of truth those who do will eventually be led to the teaching that meets their desire and their level of hunger. Don't miss that point. If you want a playpen, you will find a playpen. If you want mediocre teaching and lots of entertainment, you'll find it. If you want in-depth Bible teaching, you'll find that too, though you may have to look a lot harder. That also tests your seriousness about it. Some of you have went through that. It's taken you a long time to find a good place to learn the Word. In other words, for what they hunger and thirst for, they will get. That's what I'm trying to say. Luke 6.21a, Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Let's talk about you in relation to the world. You in relation to the world. We just talked about your relationship or, 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 or what happened to you. Uh, let's look at the point again. Let's get the words why you're different. We've looked at that. 
And let's talk about you in relation to the world. You may see yourself in a series of contempts and consist <laughs> of concentric circles. My mouth is so dry. Here we are. Let's look at this. The outer circle or ring is the world. Unbelievers, everybody. The next smaller ring is religious Christianity. Of course, I'm just talking about Christianity here. Not all the false religions. They all have their own little circle too. But we're zeroing in on who you are. So the next small circle is religious Christianity. My understanding is Christianity, uh, its religious aspect, is still considered the the largest religion in the world. Millions and millions. Within that is evangelicalism, those who truly understand the gospel of Jesus Christ and that he's the only way for salvation. And within that small circle is a smaller circle, serious the BT means Bible teaching Christianity. You truly want to know God's Word. Now, I don't know the exact percentages, but I know serious Bible teaching Christianity is very rare. If you've ever tried to look for it in your town, your city, unless you live in a large city, you may not find it. And not all large cities that I know of have it. I remember when I started my search, I started looking, listening to the radio. Uh, trying to find some, this is when I was a teenager, trying to find somebody teaching the Bible. I wasn't getting much in church. And when I really wanted to go to, I talked to my pastor about it, I remember at the time, and, and basically he handed me a little book about what Baptists believe. <laughs> then he tried to get me to go to the uh, one of the Baptist colleges. Oh, if they'd have just taught the Word. If they'd just taught the Word. But that's typical. That's typical. You will suffer conflict with all the outer rings depending on how deep you go into the smallest ring. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you're in the very smallest ring, serious Bible t teaching, Christianity, you will have conflict with everybody else. You mean you won't get along with all evangelicals? Of course not. You, some of you have already experienced that. You've written me about it. I've read letters where people keep saying that, well, people have got other Bible teachers they like too. They don't agree. You'll have to decide. You'll have to decide where you grow. Final paragraph. Those who continue on course of pursuing God through Christ and obedience to the Word of God will face many battles with the world, their own flesh, and the devil. And this is where we'll pick up in our next lesson. Let's pray. Well, Father, again, you've challenged us with all these important terms and topics that are going on today, not only these events, people's hearts and minds, but also to teach us the importance of being discerning in this world. Challenges with the things we've heard today, we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.